All right, welcome to the Art Dealer Diaries, and I have Chanto Begay here. Chanto is one of my favorite artists, and I, I don't mean that uh, flippantly either. I, I just love your stuff, Chanto. I've always big, been a big fan. You can tell he doesn't want to hear all this good stuff, but I'm going to tell <laughs> it anyway. Uh, Chanto just happened to be in today delivering me the rare paintings. We love to get paintings when we can from Chanto. He's highly in demand, but welcome, Chanto. We're going to do this all in Navajo today, right? Oh, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? What do you, what's it like to be Chanteau Begay? Oh, it comes with a great responsibility. I believe it is. <laughs> uh -huh. It is, uh huh? A lot of people think, wow, you know, they must have a beautiful, wonderful life. It is. But again, it's, it is uh, demanding in a beautiful way. And you have to meet those demands. And so I still, I'm still painting my life away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun. If you haven't watched Chanto on Facebook, you just go to his Facebook channel. It's always, <laughs> I always feel like I'm in the res or somewhere else. And another drama. And she, yeah, another drama. Chanto's never afraid to uh, put it on the line. I think that's what I like about your painting so much and what was drawn to me initially, which was about 20 years ago, that when I look at your artwork, I feel like you're um, you're not you don't pull punches. You let it you let it come. I don't know if you if that's a true statement or not, but I think it is. I think you have to. A lot of the early works, uh, not early work, but you know, the, the latter part of the last century were very some some refer to as dark, brutal, but those are buttons I needed to push at the time. And it's therapeutic as well. It's, it's releasing beautiful pieces into the world. Yeah. Well, one of the my favorite paintings, which we've loaned to probably a half a dozen museums now, is Helpless. Yes. And I look at that every day. Maybe you can tell our uh, listeners what what um what this painting's about. It's a really interesting. Some people go when they look at it, they go, "Oh, this is a very dark, uh, upsetting painting." But when I see it. Actually, I see hope. It is. Um, it's like, you know, I grew up at the foot of great medicine men, you know, weavers, healers, artists, you know, so but they were that, they were like that, you know, they were never afraid to pull punches because that's what it's required to heal and to maintain, stay maintained physically, mentally, spiritually. So you can't really pull things back, you know. We just, I try to externalize as much. But that painting you're talking about, yeah, helpless. There was um, a period of time I came and helped myself again. Mm. You know, before there was like, you know, really crazy times in Kayento on the reservation. I made this house, dark house full of people passed out, sleeping mm -hmm. in every position on the couch, on the floor, on a chair. And the only being conscious in that painting is a cat. Mm -hmm. The cat's looking at you. Uh, there is a hope. There is a hope. And then if you look at it, of course, you see your own shadow, the viewer at the door, the threshold. So it was always, for, for me, the paint was always about a choice. Mm -hmm. Do I step into this confusion and embrace it? Or do I stay out in the light? So there was, there was, there was pretty much what that the painting said, just like the other painting of the uh, the trash along the highway. Yeah, also a favorite, and I have in my yeah. collection. Years ago, when um, um, the northwest of Chinle was shown at Window Rock, I think the tribal representative from Chinle, where I based the painting at, from a real scene, I drive through there a lot, and always trash everywhere on the shoulder, trash, plastic bag. Even well, car tires and carcasses of animals. <laughs> I said this is really wild. So I went home and painted that. It was so opposite of the beautiful sheep camp, Monument Valley Canyon to shape people paint. This was brutal in your face. Right. And um, the people from Chinle, I guess, uh, took offense to that when it was shown in Window Rock because I titled it Northeast of Chinle. And they said, that's not Chinle. But it was Chinle. 
but it did rally the people, the community, to go out and clean up the whole area. Wow. Clean the whole stretch between Chinle and many farms. Clean. Everything picked up. So art affects. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think it's amazing that I look at that painting, I think, every single day. I put it where I go buy it. I'm forced to go buy it. <laughs> you know, and but that's a good thing because I think it yeah. reminds you of Mother Earth and what's going on in our world today, and um, you know that it's still beautiful and and it's funny over time. You know, I've lived with this painting for I don't know, right, ten years maybe, and over time, I think the bags, which I call Bosch's bags, um, are less noticeable, and I see more of the landscape. Yeah, you yeah. know. Uh, which I hope is how it is, and it's not just because that's how we become, you know, that the bags are really just now <laughs> part of our environment. It's just amazing. And I'll put these uh, images, I'll try to get these images yeah. up so people can see what we're talking about. I know, but uh, a little harder to understand when you're just on a mm -hmm. podcast. But, yeah. you know, I thought I'd share with uh, how I came to collect your work, because I was a collector before I ever was your dealer in art. And I first met Shanto at, um, well, I was familiar with Shanto. Shanto has done a lot of books, um, uh, children's books. He's been on the cover of Arizona Highways. Uh, he's in the Herd Museum as well. But I loved your work, and I'd go to every year to Indian Market and show up and buy a painting. And <laughs> I think it took three years each year. I'd say, hey, Shanto, i really like to show your work. I have a gallery. And Shanto would say, yeah, that maybe we might do that <laughs> yeah another year would go by <laughs> finally on the third year i had collected his work and my kids collected they love it as mm. well um i got a call one day and he said hey mark it's shanto <laughs> i'm ready to show with you i think now if you're ready <laughs> and it's been, uh, been a great run maybe you can tell us a little bit because you have a very interesting backstory too of just uh, your training and where you were and how you got to be where you are today. Yeah. Well, a lot of it, I think I credit it to, you know, that growing up, of course, in the Hogan, in a sheep camp, outside, as a shepherd, always spending time alone out there because it's a solitary job. It's being a shepherd mm. out there and just seeing your world, smelling your world, all of that, reading, drawing, just solitary. And at home, of course, no television, no electricity, no running water. Everything has to be done. Everything is taken care of very tangibly. It's that nothing is abstract. We need heat, we go get firewood. We need water, we get barrels of water. So it was, it was like that. So cornfield sustained us, sheep. That's, how I, that's why my work is steeped in that very homestead without making it a cute homestead. It's just a story, invisible voice from the land that gave me spirit, mm. that gave me vision. So I just, um, I, 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 I got picked up my, my energy, my inspiration back then, the songs, the stories. Oh my God, that's, I went to boarding school. I thought, wow, everybody can draw. I thought everybody could draw. Mm. I thought it was just a given. And then when I, to, when I found out some people can't, draw a circle mm -hmm. I said wow this is special mm. and then it, then 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 it, then it kind of um, marked my life growing up kids always flock around you say wow draw so and such and such superhero cartoon character comic book you know that's where uh, the etch a sketch etch a sketch comic books and just being in a community of stories mm. boys in boarding school with stories and excitement and you know just it, it, it's just a, creating adventures and misadventures mm -hmm. growing up. Um, of course, years later, I, I spent a lot of other time, wore many other hats. I ended up in the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. And again, being in a creative environment just gives you growth. And what years was that that you were at, I, at, at IAA? I, uh, I would say in the, in the mid 1970s, I was there. And who else was there at that before, time? Before, this, remember? before, um, other artists. Well, I think um, Doug Hyde was there. Mm. Mike Zilliox and those people. I, a lot of a lot of known artists were either ahead of me. 
at a time, yeah, people like Mike Ziliox, um, people like um, Frank Salcedo, and the more well-known people, instructors. I think Kevin Redstar was there. Mm. Uh, TC Cannon, I believe, came after I left. Mm. So a lot of great artists came out of that. A lot of great artists. Mm -hmm. But I ended up from there to the plains of Wyoming, Montana, for a couple of years. You know, getting my 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 energy out. <laughs> was that when you were being like a ranger? Well, yeah, I was doing a lot of ranging stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. And then I went to move to Berkeley, California. Mm -hmm. and that's where we lived for about seven years in the Bay Area, and that's where the uh, more of a, I guess freedom, free, you know, spirited was added into my sacredness. Yeah. How how did that really affect you being in such a big city? You come from an area where you don't have electricity or running water, you know, and now you're in this frantic environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, of art too. There's a lot of art that must have affected you as well. Just things you're seeing. Oh yeah, you know it was a culture shock. You know, it was a classic culture shock because coming from the reservation, coming from dirt roads, you know, into the major one of the major cities. Right. You know, well, like I said, everything's abstract. Every time you park, you have to pay something. <laughs> you, you, know, you have to pay something. You have to pay the, you know. Mr. Oz or something. That's but a no. painting, by the way, right there. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's a painting. But I, one of the pieces I wrote for Flagstaff Live some, a couple of years ago, I believe, was exactly on that, you know, moving from inside, from the reservation, outside into the busy, crazy world. Mm -hmm. And how I've never been living in a city in my life, but not being thrusted into that, being overwhelmed and... Um, but I never, you know, I never, I was never one to shirk away yeah. from challenges. And did you spend time going to the museums while you were there? I love museums. Yeah, I, there was there was one of the reasons what that that guided me to a lot of major cities. You know, every time I go to cities, when I was with my, with my kids and my family, we always make time. We always make time to go to the museums. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I went to a lot of museums, and um, so all the images. Of everything I saw, you know, are, are retained. But I wasn't actively looking for a, a style because I already had my images inside me. Mm. It was just a matter of coaxing them out. I had all of these because I grew up without any kind of outside entertainment outside of myself. Mm. So the stories were within. And of course, um, as the years went by, I that. Uh, my painting naturally delve into the style that I employ now, which is uh, kind of a neo-impressionist right. style, which is, uh, for me, has always been continuing prayer, chants, like I said. Like a visible, like a, uh, like a, um, a chant, a visible chant. It's, um, I employ those lines, those dots, those little squiggles, those circles, there's curvy lines. I think all of those, I see them as syllables. Mm. Syllables to words, to sentences, to paragraphs, to great groupings of Navajo prayers. And do you always have like little chindi that are in the spirits that are in the paintings? Because, you know, well, I, I see those on a lot of them. <laughs> and sometimes I don't know if I'm actually overseeing things, but. Well, that's good that you see those things. Yeah. Sometimes I don't see it. Sometimes I see people, other people tell me, oh, did you see this? And right. I said, wow. Because right. somehow they they invent themselves. They put themselves in there. And I just, I'll just let it be. Right. It's kind of like a, kind of like my spirit break in some ways. Yeah. Like in a Navajo yeah. run. Yeah. Right. So for uh -huh. those who don't know what that means, a spirit line, it's a way when the weavers make a weaving that they put a spirit line so they can get from the outside uh, or the inside of the rug to the outside a way of escaping and, and also keeping things not perfect. Yeah. And, and now, so I've had lots of people say, oh, I feel like he's paint. there's a painting of Van Gogh because of the way that you use your paint. And I say, no, this is just Shanto's way of doing it. But has that had any effect, Van Gogh? Did, did, did his seeing his things in museums affect you or is that just coincidental that there's this sense? 
I think it was totally coincidental. We just, both of us, and countless of impressionists, I think, um, right. tap into the same stream of energy somehow. Yeah. And so we went with that. Um, so I didn't study Van Gogh. I mean, I, I graduated with a degree in art history. Right. And so, but there was a, the, not the period I studied. Was that at Berkeley? In, yeah. At Berkeley, yeah. yeah. So I, um, I was aware of the man, but I was really keen on his art or anything like that at the time. I just loved everything. And then somehow, when I started working with this, that style of um, using lines as alphabets, as syllables, mm -hmm. became what it's supposed to be. It's a great um, visual dance, communication to all the uh, subfractality of our world. Sometimes I get people come back to me and say, I was driving across such and such a landscape and I saw why you paint the way you do. Mm -hmm. and just, you know, so people find that, that their own way of connecting with that, with that vision. Well, my daughter gave my son yeah. a, a painting this year for Christmas. And I looked and I go, this looks like how Shanto does his. He goes, well, I live with Shanto in my room for the, <laughs> my entire life. He, she goes, I can't help but be influenced. So uh -huh. it's still going down. You know, she's an artist and it's still kind yeah. of finding its way. You're, you're yeah. influencing other people as well, which is uh, not surprising. I mean, you have a, a big role out on the, on the reservation. I mean, it seems like to yeah. me that that's as important to you, if maybe more important, probably is, but you can tell me than the paintings themselves, the community, the sense of what you need to give back to your world. On that thought, yeah. Every year, every year, the first the first weekend in June, in, in my community of Shanto, mm -hmm. we have a, an, an event, a musical, um, art, fine arts, food, performances, a festival. Mm -hmm. Now it's two days. It's an amazing event. It's called Rashanto Rock the Canyon. Rock the Canyon. It's in, it, it's in the canyon underneath the giant coffee trees with the creek running through it. And this is something you started and did? No, it's, 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 it's what the community started, uh, my community. Mm, mm. And because, oh, of, because yeah, mm. because a lot of kids are, are there, they don't, they're, they're kind of not, not really know what they what they want to be or what they're going into they're not even sure if they can even survive mm. so the community started this program where they picked one artist or one a person that came from the community born and raised in the community went out made a name came back and and, and, and doing successfully so they decided to do something like that every year for the kids in the community so you can tell so we can say that we're from here too mm. you can be you can, you can get here from there it was a positive note to, to the young people growing up there. So um, every year they chose an artist from there. This is the 10th year, this coming June. I was the very first one back in 2009, I believe. Mm. And then after that series of art, artists in the local community in Shanto. Yeah, and explain to people where Shanto is, because they may not know it's a small area up in northern Shanto Arizona. Is up in, Shanto is up in the northwest, northeast area of Arizona, up on the Navajo Nation. And it is um, between Tuba City and Cayenta. Mm -hmm. It's off of 160, Highway 160. It's way up there, the northern Navajo Nation. It's a beautiful area, high land, you know, around 7,000 feet in elevation. Yeah. Not far from Monument Valley. Not far from Monument Valley. Monument Valley is kind of over the bluff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it's a beautiful area. So this year we, we, we're doing... We're doing uh, um, our Rock Canyon June June first uh, and second, Friday and Saturday. It's going to be a big event. I'm going to set up my booth there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set up my booth there, and I have prints. I got tons of little one of those old prints I had. I've mm -hmm. been having for years. I think just give it away to kids, young people. Sign up for them and say, hey, this is them. Yeah, this um, is where you can be, and this yeah. is what you can do. Yeah, so not 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 really setting up the sale. Just to be make my presence, yeah. Because every year, we choose an amazing artist, a great artist from town, from the area. Because mm -hmm. we have plenty, painters, sculptors, weavers, basket makers, potters, silversmiths, probably. Yeah, yeah. 
so so this is the this this is why we celebrate our, our own community this way now we have like a about 40 40 band or something playing wow the stage is never empty they are wow. all the genre and uh it's, it's the shanto woodstock of exactly <laughs> that's very exactly. cool Foods, and it's open to everyone it's open to everyone it's the free you can even camp down there to yeah. keep the canyon and so and that my home my studio is uh only maybe two or three miles away oh wow yeah yeah one of my favorite paintings came from your home yeah the greatest view <laughs> I gotta, that i gotta do again yeah I gotta do it tell again. them what the greatest view is it's a wonderful well, painting out, out in my studio it is a shanto it's a beautiful place out in the Penny and Juniper Forest. Sagebrush fields and slick rocks and mesas. Nobody's out there. And um, it's up high in the mesa, so I overlook the whole valley of Kletla and the uh, black mesa in the background. And so I have an outhouse. <laughs> outhouse need no door because there's nobody up there to see you. It's, right. it's, a, bit, it's, a, it's, it's a really private situation. Only the only thing, birds and the rabbits and serpents. Um, so when you sit in there, you see the frame of the outdoor, outhouse <laughs> store, and the beautiful landscape beyond. That's beautiful, just from just right outside the door, at that way towards the rising sun. So it's 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 a, it's a beautiful area. It's a beautiful little space, you know. Yeah. So I painted that picture from, from the outhouse called the greatest the grandest of view yeah that's it the grandest of view <laughs> i plan on going and seeing that view one day right there yeah <laughs> yeah it's on my list it's a bucket list for me <laughs> <laughs> but it is a that's where that came from i like i like catching new visions mm. i like catching you know what might be actually a supporting image or vision of a grander view mm -hmm. you know everybody paints grand canyon Right. Grand Canyon, beautiful. No, I admire that, but it's a little thing that make that vision possible. You know, now one of the things you've done, which I always thought was interesting, and you've explained it to me on paintings before on shows we've had, but you'll do this aerial view of, like, say, Shanto, and I remember asking you, well, have you ever, you know, looked above and done any of this with either a, you know, a drone or whatever? And you haven't, right? But yet you can, you know, every aspect of that land. Yes. A land about that, I'd say about four, roughly four miles long, three miles wide. That area that I just heard sheep growing up and you know, the, the wild land up there. Now. And um, after a while, of course, you you walk the sheep trail. You know where the water pockets, the water catches are, where mm -hmm. it rains. You know where water stays longer. You know where the ravines, the sage flats, the sand dunes, all of that. You know, so. I, I work for my mind. I read I, I, one of the paintings I did. I did walk that whole area. You know, just after rain, you can see the shadow of the clouds, the rainstorm over the landscape, and I put myself as a, a cloud, mm. a view from the cloud, and looking at all the freshly filled water holes, way down there, all the little turquoise spots, and the road, the dirt road, the co connected communities and families. It's one of the more sort of people see that sometimes see that as an abstract painting. It is, I, in a lot of ways, it is. Yeah, and I know so, some of the times I see light coming down and yeah. hitting different areas of importance. I think you were telling me that was maybe this is where your placenta was buried or yeah. something like this, and you know. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. Uh, um, I like you know changing my view, changing my view. I, I, I wanted to um, continue that further somehow. And you've also worked on, I don't know if it's, it, it came up, but there was a, a movie that you were an extra in, or, or not actually an extra, you were a leading role in that movie. What's happened to that? Well, Monster Slayer, you can still see on YouTube um, before its release. Monster Slayer is a, a Canadian production that was mm -hmm. uh, three years I don't know, three or maybe four summers ago, I spent the whole summer in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. And I played the, um, the grandfather of the Hero Twins. And the Hero Monster Twins, Slayer. if you don't know, are... It's an Navajo Messiah story. Yep. Yep. And so the twins are the, the heroes that cleanse the fourth world of monsters. And I played the grandfather that guided those Hero Twins to mm. be their best. 
Mm hmm. And that was mm -hmm. a really cool grandfather. So, cast of five, including the monster. It was a great film. You know, with Flagstaff on, by the man had it shown twice at the Orphan Theater. And uh, now it's, I think it's still in, in, the, in, the, in the films festival. And when you played that, did you feel like you were literally channeling that kind of energy? I think so. I think so because the character's name is Wichel Cowboy Yazi. A great dossier. He's a medicine man, Vietnam War, decorated war hero, um, a rodeo cowboy, uh -huh. champion of some kind, and it's also a heavy drinker. <laughs> <laughs> Until a beautiful woman comes to his life, marries uh -huh. him, and saves him from his downward spiral. Yeah. It said. But when the director called me to to take that role, he said, um, Shantu, could you please consider taking this role on because we developed the character based on you. Yeah, I can believe that. So, so you are that, a character. <laughs> I read that and said, wow, I, I actually like this. Yeah. So I did. I, I took on the role, Cowboy Ozzy. <laughs> the last one I did is uh, out of LA. Uh -huh. And that's a, a film called Alex and Jamie, which is totally different. It's a beautiful love story <clears throat> spanning um, was like 40 years. And they met at their, their twenties, <clears throat> and they have fantastic stories, you know, them, both challenges and everything like that. It's J Alex and Jamie. Is this a recent thing you did? This is that 2015. Oh, yeah, I didn't know about this one. 2015 yeah. or 2016? I think it was 2016. Uh -huh. Spring of 2016 is when they filmed that, and um, that was a love story. But it was a. Uh, uh, I played. I, I played Jamie. Alex is that, and Alex. is that out? That movie is that out yet? It just opened a film festival in Oslo. Uh huh. So it's all over the world it's doing film festival. Wow! But Alex and Jamie, every every eight years, every eight years, the, the actors changed, but it's the same story, the same character. It's the same story, but it's oh, because, wow. of, because it's a universal love story. Yeah. There's um, a different, maybe different race, different gender. Just different, um, different uh, new act, pairs of actors uh -huh. playing this character on and on. I played Jamie in his sixties after after he lost um, Alex to leukemia or something. Uh -huh. like that. So he's alone. He's uh, painting, reading, building a fire, and tending his tomato plant. And did you have to memorize lines in the whole shebang, or was it well, more? I, a... I just read the script and then I know what it was going to say, and I just ad lib. I said, yeah. I, I don't want to read the script. Same with Monster Slayer. I said. I'll read the script and see what it says, and then I'll just say it my own way. Yeah. So it's more real. It's more real. Yeah. So. And did they find you as uh, because you were a, a, a love interest? They find you on Facebook because. <laughs> With the last one, I don't know how they did it, but you know they they, took, they got me interest interested. Yeah. And that like like that in the end, and and if Alex and Jamie have been alone for a while. Yes. And Tomato plays a big part in this film. I don't know. I don't want to give it away, but yeah. But um. In the end, in the end, I met somebody else. It knew. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of alluded, you know, they did a little crossword puzzle, tomato somehow fell into that, and the eyes met, and the smile came. Right. And the credit rolled. Do you see yourself doing more of that? I mean, obviously you've oh, done yeah. it too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can see you doing well, it. Well, I got two more scripts. Uh huh. One of them I, I, I readily turned, off, turned down and said, I don't want to be part of this film. It's crazy. Yeah, it's just too. too you got to be very careful with what what your what film or what film your name's associated with. Right. Because um, you know, it could be something that doesn't do you any good. Right. So I turned one down because it was kind of really stereotype, kind of going to pushing the edge of hokiness. Right. Right. Yeah. The other one I want to do again is a continuation of um, Cowboy. Yeah, for, mon for the Monster Slayer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You like you you relate to that guy. I relate to that guy, you know, because uh, you know, all I gotta do is act naturally, <laughs> like, this, like the song says. <laughs> They're gonna put me in the movie. <laughs> They're gonna make a big star out of me. There's a story about a man who's lost and lonely. 
And all I gotta do is act naturally. <laughs> and he's a singer, folks. He's a singer too. It doesn't surprise me. Shanta can do everything. <laughs> and not only do you have, you know, acting and your painting, but you've had, you you're a very good. I I've told people this a lot of times. You're a fantastic writer. And maybe you could expose a little bit on some of the things that you've written and what you're doing in that. And you write a, yeah. an article in Flagstaff on a regular basis, right? Yeah, I have a, um, a um, an article for nine and a half years, a column, I should say. Yeah. And I, I loved it. I love writing because writing, to me, when you do when you something, when you do no matter how long or short or how long, you know, do you write a good piece? It's like creating a good painting. Yeah, I agree. Wow, with that. it's just, because you feel it in a, you feel it in a very different way. Not so much visually, you feel it more just deeper mm -hmm. somehow. But uh, nine and a half years gave me a lot of time to write about a lot of aspects of my growing up, my life, my inspirations, my dreams. Um, I never went politics or, 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 or religion. Mm -hmm. You know, there's anything else under them because there's plenty to say. <laughs> Growing the boarding school brutality, of course. And it was a way for me to cleanse. Um, it was very much, um, uh, um, um, I guess a um, a way to get through transcending, talking about externalizing about that boarding school All of that, huh? Because that I was really a that. very yeah. traumatic part of your life. So, um, so, th so that, that, that's what I wrote for nine and a half years, and that twelve hundred words, you know, each time it, with no guidance, just go for it. And how often does that come out? There was four writers of us, so we t we t we took <clears> turn each month. So each month, uh, quarterly my, year up there. My, my turn would come up. So I, I wrote twelve articles, twelve columns a year. Wow! And can people find that uh, online? Would it be under the flag in the flag, flag side paper? Yes, flaglive dot com. dot com, and um, just go to. Uh, the, 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 the section under letters from home mm. letters from home is just our writings and um because all four of us writers were, wrote from a different angle mm. some talk about fruits and cooking and farming and stuff right. like that you know and i talk about my culture and art mm -hmm. dreams so we all uh, we were not beating a subject to death we we're all coming from different worldview and that was beautiful and do you find people because I know I write books too. I write murder mysteries, but and I find that some people really associate me with my writing more than being an art dealer. Do you find that people, there's a group of people, who just know you as a writer and really not as the painter? What you know? Because I mean, most people think of you as the painter, but I'm sure you, after nine years, you must have people out there go, oh wow. I, I do have some. Some people do. <laughs> they ask me, um, you know, like to, to write that forward to books or something like that. Yeah. And I, I like that. Sometimes they send me a script, a manuscript of a book that's about to be published to yes. read the whole thing and to say something when, like those little blurbs. Blurbs, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I've been doing some of that. Um, but I need to I need to get back into writing because I, I have all those writings, all those, all those nine and a half years of writing I still have that could go into a book. And of course, um, the, 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 that would be a book in itself, yeah. wouldn't it? Oh yeah. I mean, I could see that as being a very interesting book. But yeah, I, illustrated I, I, with paintings. I want the paintings though for the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> and I like, um, yeah, I, I liked it. I really enjoyed writing because, like I said, it's like painting. Uh huh. Especially not the, the years I spent doing children's books, and that was also another good. Yeah, tell people about that. They're very wonderful books. I have people coming in trying. You know, we have yeah. them to show. You know what you did we don't sell them we, and people are always trying to buy these books or that first of all are, are any of those still in print i believe so i know that navajo long walk is still in print mm -hmm. and you did the mural for that at, at, bosco, at redondo. bosco redondo and for those Which, who don't know yeah. bosco redondo in 1864 to 1868 uh, Diné or the navajos were in prison it wasn't a pretty sight and um and that is something i'd, I'd also like to touch on is just that yeah I mean, that had to be very 
intense doing that in a lot of ways, not only from an emotional, but even a political, I it, would think. It was a very, very, very powerful um, um, undertaking. That's something I took that, uh, what's that, at the time was that, that, that what still is, was new, the newest addition to the New Mexico State Museum system. Mm -hmm. They wanted to do the Basque Dandi, the Long Walk Memorial Museum mm -hmm. in Fort Sumner. So um, the architect, I guess somehow they decided that they wanted a mural. They would ask me if I could do a mural inside the huge walk, circular right. walk. So I did. So the whole image of the creating was was painful. I, I did it in my student Flagstaff. Mm. I did it um, not to size. They they blew it up mm. later from a, from a, where I use it, uh, one inch for every foot. Mm. And then they blew it up to a much larger size, the mural size. But going back over there, when I saw it open and seeing the mural there and going through there, was a, it was a very, very um, moving event. Yeah. It been moving. I mean, it would have been easy for me to say it's too powerful. I don't want to do it. Right. I could but, see that easily. But I can. You know, you, 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 I just went to it. Yeah. Because it's something that needed to be done. And from people, more people that know more about the atrocities that occurred in the 1860s. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of yeah. a lot of Diné won't even go back to that area at all, yes. right? Yes, they won't. But this summer, June 8th and 9th, we're going to have a huge event there. It's wow, kind of going, I didn't um, even know about that. It, uh, the governor's going to be there. We're going to have a bunch of people there, the state officials. And they're going to reenact, not reenact, but you do in silence, seven miles of a walk. Mm. as well at the museum dedication the whole museum um, speaking and lunch and everything like that so I'm going to drive back out there even though it's way the heck out there 160 yeah. miles beyond Albuquerque by the way I grew up next to that really I grew up in Portales yep so you know where it is okay there's nothing out there folks it's desolate <laughs> it's really desolate that's that probably... is why they chose that place for the that's right I'm sure yeah for, for, for the um for the concentration camp. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what it was, was a concentration camp. Yeah. And I think, you know, Americans don't realize this. And right. I, you know, I give lectures on Navajo textiles all the time, and I bring this up and talk to people. And I always ask, who knows this? You know, it's one of my main questions. And it's always just a yeah. s small amount of hands that go up, and I'm always shocked. I'm, I think more people know about the, the Cherokee Trail and that's Tears. Right. And not, than this in, in the 1800s, in the 1860s. Fort Sumner, Basque Down the probably was the most the most populated area outside of the one of the places in in, in New Mexico. Yeah, I believe in New Mexico. Yeah, it was like eight, ten thousand people there, right? Yeah. So yeah, so it was um it's a powerful space. It's a powerful space. I just went back out there again in a few months ago. Mm. Can you feel it when you're there? You must be able to feel. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's got to be. Oh yeah, yeah you feel. Yeah. You feel the whole energy and you can still feel the cries of the wind. Yeah. And right there by, by the Pecos. Yep. Which runs sometimes and sometimes doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> so back to children's books. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a hard transition from <laughs> death and mayhem and one of the worst atrocities in Native well, American history to something more uplifting, which are your children's books, which yeah. really are. I will, Beloved. I will do, I think I'll do more of that. You know, I've just been t taking a break. I never left there, I never leave anything. I go back, you know, sometimes I, sometime I go back, you know, the profession, I, you know, get get back to um, maybe doing some more children's books. You know, I think I'm sitting on a few of them. Mm. In your head or you've already done them? I, I, I wrote a draft, mm. a couple of drafts, and, uh, and each time I think it's getting better. But, um, and how yeah. many did you do? How many have been published? Do you remember? Well, Scholastic, maybe seven or eight. Yeah. And then with Putnam, two, National Geographic, one. Yeah. And then if, if, uh, with, with other publishing houses, uh, maybe five others. Wow. And then, of course, on top of that, I did a bunch of instructionals, mm. for, like textbooks, mm -hmm. like Scott Forsman, Macmillan, mm -hmm. uh, Jamestown, you know, even even redoing books for 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 for, for textbooks, mm -hmm. redoing illustration. I did 
I read the illustration, did an illustration for Jack London's Call of the Wild. Wow, I didn't know that. And um, Scott O'Dell's um, Island of the Blue Dolphin. Uh huh. I mean, what I know about dolphin is under 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 the under the, under the, 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 the bottle nose dolphin. Right. You know, good thing. In the, National Geographic is a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they even did a, uh, a story of a little girl in the down the Copper Canyon, the Tar Uh huh. So that was um. And then somebody was doing a book on you, wasn't it? Wasn't there a? There's a lady named yeah. Hannah Hannah Leif uh -huh. that did a little a little pamphlet, a little book on me some years ago for for level grade reader, mm -hmm. like third grade or something like that. You know, Sean took his life and his. I have yet to get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when, that, when I started, all of a sudden, when I was a keynote speaker <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I was a keynote speaker in the, in, at the University of Georgia in Athens mm. at the, uh, the Southwest Children's Literature Convention. Mm -hmm. It was a huge convention of authors and children's book people, various publishing houses all over the East Coast and everywhere. So um, they asked me if I could give a keynote. So I did. And and then of course I signed books later, mm -hmm. and that that little book started appearing in front of me. Wow! I said, "Where did this come from?" <laughs> this is about you. <laughs> that you hadn't seen yet. No. Oh, that's funny. So that that was uh, that was the first time I saw that. <laughs> but I said, "Yeah, I still I still keep my keep the irons going, sticking the fire of the children's literature, right? Writing, of course, painting. Um, How about music?" Know, we haven't talked about that. I mean, you have a beautiful voice. I didn't even know that. Do you do music at all? I I, I certainly don't. <laughs> I'm learning, I'm, I want to learn how to play harmonica, though. Yeah. Which is my current. I want to play harmonica. Uh huh. And are I, you trying? Are you working on that right now? I am. I got two, uh, gifted two beautiful set of harmonica with all the keys. Uh huh. And so because I feel like I can I can practice while I'm driving. Yeah. All right. And yeah. how's that going? Hmm? How's it going? I'm not as good as Charlie McCoy, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you're working on it. <laughs> but I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I, I loved to sing when I was a kid. Mm. Navajo songs, new songs. Not, not Can new you give songs. us one? A little bit <laughs> in Navajo. People don't realize how beautiful the language is. I think it is. A lot of it's just social songs. Just social. Yeah. Not so much a you know the, and not so much a. Um, Sacred song, but yeah, like social song, right? <clears throat> if you are close to me, you will make me go hippity hop. But if you hold my hand, you will make me go skippity skip. There's a lot of small little things that you sing when you're growing up. And sometimes you just sing alone, way out there. Right. And, and, you know, just at the top of your lungs, just a, yeah, a lot, a, lot, a lot of gaming songs, winter songs, coyote songs. You know, do you think some of that's getting lost? And in, in some of the ways I say it is that the kids just don't herd oh, yeah. sheep anymore, and they're on their phones all the time. Oh yeah, just in that little little screen. Right. It is. It, it is getting lost. It is. It is getting lost. Um. It 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 has it has been for a while. But using the technology, the same technology, that is this drawing them with the attention. I think that it's also not being used to bring the language back, mm. bring a lot of the Navajo, all of that back. Because I I spent many, many, many hours also helping develop a Rosetta Stone for Navajo language. Oh, wow. And uh, so that's out, that's out on the market too. And is it through the the company Rosetta Stone? Yes. Yeah, I tried Rose to learn today at one time. <laughs> Rosetta Stone. Very difficult. Yeah. For us non-native speakers, you can get it uh, through universities. Uh huh. To Navajo Nation Museum. Yeah, and through in Flagstaff University. University, I'm sure you can get it in a variety of places. And when, so you grew up obviously speaking Dene. That's if, your primary language. Yeah. When did you start? using English was it at the that exactly at that time did your mom and dad speak English at all no no my mother and my father never spoke or wrote 
English. Mm. It was it was all Navajo. And uh, we grew up speaking Navajo, thinking Navajo, mm. all of that. It wasn't until the um once it wasn't until after we were kidnapped from the uh, sheep trail and thrust it into the boarding school right. and forced several years uh, um, in the early 60s, yeah. I was um, maybe five, six years old, seven years old when they started, when they started really, because you spent pretty much all your time in a boarding school and you were punished when you spoke a word of Navajo. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, it's it a, I mean <laughs> that affects mm. people. It for is. long periods of time. It and is. so do you think in Navajo when you think now, or do you think in both languages? I think I spoke, I think in both. Yeah. Somewhere in between. Yeah. yeah. Another good title for a painting, by yeah. the way. And, and it's also another good practice I realize now when I'm painting in the studio, uh -huh. sometimes a friend will come in just to, a friend I don't mind there. Right. Maybe they could play guitar or something like that. Uh, doing their own thing or right. just making a gen genuine conversation right that I'd enjoy and I could paint listen to the person paint and I would I was neither fully there or here mm. there's somewhere in between here mm -hmm. and I feel like that's when you really hit the magic and then when your hours go by and the person goes away and you look back at your world and say wow how this how this grew this fast this it just flows yes that creative flow yeah I think that was what real artists have um, is they somehow can channel that being yeah. and let it out, and it's just almost I, automatic. I believe that, you know, because um, a lot of artists I know just wait for inspiration, mm -hmm. and then they it never comes, and they spend months not making anything. Right. And I tell them, hey, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up. It's so true. Yeah, I mean, it is so true. I mean, all I always say, almost every artist that I represent, which is about twenty-five artists, they don't wait for inspiration. Mm -mm. They're in there working in their studio. Yeah, things come when you put. Yeah, one of my brush to paint. One of my mentor years ago told me, draw every day, draw something every day, mm -hmm. even on days you can't, you don't feel like it, or you don't want to, or you feel like you can't do it, you can't even draw anything, especially those days. Mm -hmm. Do your worst. Do your worst. I you love know, that. Just keep bringing it out. Right. Keep bringing it out. So I've always, I've always remembered those words. I think those are critical. Do mm -hmm. your worst. Yeah. You know, and, and it sounds, uh, sounds ironic, but it's true. I mean, if you don't, yeah. if you, if you can write, or in your case, paint on the days where you don't want to do it, you're an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're tapping into that yeah. sensibility. And you know, I, I think if you could just talk about one other painting that's in my collection because it's so powerful. I find it very powerful. It's um, and what I like about this painting is you worked on it. I think you told me for eight years, a single painting, and it's the one where all the words are in the background. And Dene, and then you <laughs> marked out certain words, and then you worked on other words, and there's a uh, happy finger being pointed at the audience. <laughs> wow, that's in my bedroom, by the way. Yeah, that painting it went through many. That painting went through several phases, I guess, several expressions, mm. several you know, com com sense of communication. Because uh, initially, my good friend Bruce Hucker. Bruce is a um, Moab, Utah-based photographer, mm -hmm. and uh, he documented a lot of Navajo life mm -hmm. back back then. And um, he's an art kid, art coach to young Navajo students. But one of the photographs he did years ago was at the Shiprock Northern Navajo Fair mm -hmm. in September of many years ago. He said he's walking by one of the stands, and and there was a drunk guy leaning slouch against the wall which happened to be the a mormon church stand uh-huh the jesus christ latter-day saint church of jesus christ latter-day saint and so bruce said wow this is an interesting combination so he went he went to take his picture and the right. guy, this guy struggled up with his can of beer and his paper sack right and they threw him the finger <laughs> And just as what just as what he took just as he took the picture, and he was very he was had this angry, drunken look. 
I said, I said, wow, this is fantastic photo. So I painted that as it was, with the, with the Mormon church sign in the background, and then it sat with me for a while. And then after that, it needed something more. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I kept feeling and seeing the man's anger, frustration, sense of helplessness. And then I wanted to give him prayer and words. Mm. I want to give him words. I want to give him something to hang his anger on. So I took the, the background out and I just wrote his, his anger. Mm -hmm. And I wrote his anger, his frustration. And these are all single kind of words yeah. and phrases. So, uh, so I, I, let, I, I let that go. Let it, let it, let it, let it be his for a while. Mm. And then I kind of whitewash it a little bit. And then over it, the voice of his mother mm. calling him back. Call him back through the center. Redemption. Yes. And that took years, right? Yeah. For you to work on that. And where did that painting live while you had that? Was that in your studio? Oh, it was. It didn't see the light of day. It was in my studio put put away. Yeah. Yeah. That that painting was in my daughter's room for yeah. about <laughs> five years. Now it's in my bedroom. And uh, wow. Right. Now you know what? I think it's good to have that. Yeah, it is that redemption. energy, whatever it is, right, uh -huh. you know, and I think that's important to, for people to understand that paintings, um, they do have energy that it's not just a matter of the visuals, but there's something else that in there. Uh, in this case, the backstory of that's pretty incredibly powerful. And I shared that backstory yeah. with all my children so they know what they're, right. you know, kind of, you know, though I didn't know all of it. Now I do. Yeah, I, I, I try to. um I try not to paint in a in a vacuum. Of course, mm. everything has to have a story. Everything has to have a narrative. All your work has to have, um, you know, you know, it, it it needs to be given its own identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I, I think I see that in mm -hmm. all paintings, even the, your little teeny paintings. Yeah, they seem to have. There's always something there. So, you know what amazes me is we're almost out of time. <laughs> you, apparently you have to go somewhere and I, sna yeah. <laughs> I snagged you you know when you came to he you came to deliver paintings yeah. which were grateful thank you for the paintings uh we're always yeah. grateful to get paintings yeah. by the way they're they're wonderful and it's not just a matter of having artwork to sell it's actually more than that well, i mean i live with your work around me you'll, you'll you know, see some the more amazing work coming coming down the pipeline i i promise you well, that's, so, a, that's where I want to live. And it's on tape now. Yeah. <laughs> I promise and, you um, more paintings. And um, yeah, Diane's a good manager for me. She, she cracks the uh, velvet whip. <laughs> <laughs> so well, keep, she, well, we keep cracking it so we can have you back yeah. again. And So I knew her kids when they were very small. Uh -huh. And kind of a, a father figure when growing up. So now Sophia's graduating. That's where we're down here. So you're going to see, yeah. Uh, yeah. And for people who don't know, you can find Shanto at Indian Market every year too, as well in Santa Fe, right? You're still keeping uh, going? Yeah, this year I'll probably just be walking around. Oh, wow, that's a first. Because I didn't apply. Uh, so I doubt it will be. Well, if you see Shanto walking around, Ask him if he has Ask anything him. in the back of his truck. Yeah, because <laughs> he will. I guarantee you, I bought things from him like that. Shanto Begay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Mark. Spending a little time with me. And we'll have this again sometime soon. Okay. Shanto Begay. All right. All right. Thank you.